Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Anim Action. Welcome to part two of my studio retrospective on Hanna-Barbera Productions. Hopefully you've already watched part one that was posted a few weeks back, but if not, you'll probably want to check it out. In that video, I cover the history of the studio from slightly before its founding up through the end of 1969. In this video, I had every intention of covering the rest of their run, but, well, they have a whole lot of material. As this is the alternating video for this week, look for a new poll for next week's video to go up on Patreon tonight or tomorrow. As usual, if you love all things animated and animation adjacent, then make sure to like and subscribe so this train can keep rolling. Now let's head back to the era of disco and bell bottoms and pick up our look at Hanna Barbera in 1970. Though they probably didn't know it yet, Hanna Barbera ended the 60s by accidentally discovering the recipe that they'd be applying time and again throughout the next couple of decades. Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? aired for 17 episodes in its first season from September 1969 through January of 1970, and followed it up with a second season that was eight episodes long from September to October of this year, as a way to break away from their mid-60s action-oriented output. That particular era of programming for them had led to several petitions and protests by parent group Action for Children's Television, who found the material in shows like The Herculoids and Birdman to be too violent. Scooby-Doo was made with the help of CBS to be the solution to that, and the format of a group of teens solving mysteries proved incredibly popular. But we've already talked about Scooby and the gang in the last video, so let's instead look at how those junior sleuths changed the trajectory of the studio. Honestly, for their first new series of the decade, it didn't. Instead, the first of three shows that Hanna-Barbera released in 1970 tried to follow the Flintstones model. Where's Huddles was a primetime sitcom released to fill the seasonal off-schedule for variety show Hee Haw. The series was based on the families of two professional football players who lived next door to each other, and was structurally and story-wise cut straight from the Flintstone cloth, even using some of the same voice actors from that series, most notably with Mel Blanc and Gene Vanderpill. The series wasn't received well enough to continue past its initial ten episodes, though, and was the last cartoon the studio would air in primetime until the 1990s. Well, almost. We'll get to that later. There were a couple of other shows and works for the year, though, that both released for the new programming schedule that September. The first of these was based on the professional exhibition basketball team, the Harlem Globetrotters, which was also co-produced with CBS. On a side note, I went to a Globetrotters game once as a kid, and it was pretty great. They were a lot of fun to watch. Anyway, the series followed the team's adventures from city to city, as in each new place they'd inevitably get wrapped up in some conflict or mystery that would be brought to a satisfying conclusion through, what else, basketball. Throw in an animal companion in the form of mascot Dribbles and an old lady named Granny as the team's manager and bus driver, and you had a fairly successful formula for a cartoon. You also had a platform to bring in some fresh voice talent, and for this series, Hanna-Barbera cast notable names like Scatman Crothers, Stu Gilliam, who was a stand-up comedian known from appearances on series like the Ed Sullivan and Dean Martin shows, vaudevillian actor and longtime veteran of the Jack Benny show, Eddie Rochester Anderson, and Robert Dequee, who you all may recognize as the recurring character of Sergeant Reed in all three Robocop films. The show was significant as it was the first Saturday morning cartoon to feature a predominantly African-American cast. That was a big deal, as up until this point, the only African-American in a Saturday morning animated series had been Pete Jones from the previous year's filmation adaptation of The Hardy Boys, and that character was voiced by a white actor. Hanna-Barbera actually doubled down on the representation this year with their final animated series, though, a spin-off of the Archie comics called Josie and the Pussycats. The show took the characters from the comic, mostly at least, as it swapped the comics Pussycat Pepper with an African-American Valerie, see, I told you they doubled down on expanding the representation, and placed them in an animated series that more closely followed the structure of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You?, than their original comic stories, having the main trio and their supporting characters, including a very Fred-looking manager and shaggy-acting roadie, get wrapped up in some mystery or adventure in each episode. As the original concept for Scooby-Doo had focused on the teen characters as a band under the name Mysteries 5, Josie and Friends were a perfect choice to apply the formula to. It also didn't hurt that Filmation had released an Archie series a couple of years prior that was a huge rating success, and HB was looking to get a slice of that musical adventure pie. It worked, though, and the series was another big hit for the studio this year. Oddly, it's an early example of taking a series that you start running out of ideas for and putting it in space, as that's where the show ended up for its third and final season. Also noteworthy for this series is the music, which was professionally recorded by musicians rather than the series' voice actors. While the speaking parts were performed by Janet Waldo, see my last episode for more on this prolific actor, as Josie, Jackie Joseph, who played Audrey in Roger Corman's Little Shop of Horrors movie as Melody, and Barbara Perriott, who actually mostly left acting after this role, as Valerie. The voices for the musical recording were different people. 
For the songs, the series used Kathy Doer as Josie, who has that role as her only credit in IMDb, Patrice Halloway, who had been a recording artist for Motown Records and was actually the reason the Pepper character was replaced by Valerie, and notable member of Charlie's Angels, Cheryl Ladd. There are some interesting stories about the series, so this one may be a good candidate for a future deep dive. Those first couple of years of the 70s were fairly slow for the studio, with no feature films or TV specials. Instead, in 1970 and 71, the studio produced the three previously mentioned series and another three the following year. They'd also had a failed attempt at a fourth with Duffy's Dozen, but the pitch hadn't been picked up. Instead, they had a spin-off of the Flintstones with the Pebbles and Bam Bam show, a new anthropomorphic comedy with Help, It's the Hair Bear Bunch, and The Funky Phantom, which was a copy of the Scooby-Doo formula using a Civil War ghost instead of an animal sidekick. It was also the first series Hanna-Barbera made using an Australian production company, in this instance, Air Programs International. They did continue some work in their other business lines during this time, though, continuing to produce commercials for Flintstones Vitamins and the National Brewing Company, as well as adding new campaigns for Aurora Plastics Corporation and the serials Fruit Loops and Pebbles. They also produced several more of the industrial and educational videos we talked about last episode, including a quartet of them for the Los Angeles County Medical Association's anti-drug campaign. Things would definitely pick up the following year, though. As I'd mentioned their work with an Australian studio a bit earlier, it's also probably a good time to point out that the following year, in 1972, Hanna-Barbera expanded to open their own animation studio in that country, which worked on several of their properties through this and the next decade, and who was assigned as the main studio for the famous classic tale series, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. As I said, things picked up here in 1972 with six new series, or seven if you count the Pussycats Move to Space, the launch of the ABC Saturday Superstar movie, a contribution to ABC's after-school specials, a Christmas special, a live-action TV movie, a new TV show title sequence, and their continuing commercial and industrial film work. This would actually be the model that would steer the studio through the rest of the decade as well, with 40 more animated series released between 73 and 79. However, I'm covering the studio here, not necessarily the content, so thankfully I won't be diving into all of them. Instead, I'll focus on their biggest trends and successes over the decade and the significant events for them as a studio, starting with this year's comeback for Scooby-Doo with the new Scooby-Doo movies. This not only brought back one of their most successful recent creations, but employed a guest star structure that featured a new celebrity in each week's episode, which was another first for the studio. Over the course of its two seasons, it not only had a massive lineup of talent from the era show up in each of its 24 episodes, but it also proved the quick and easy success of its formula once and for all. Over the rest of the decade, Hanna-Barbera would release a dozen or more series that presented various takes on the motif, including another here in 72 with The Amazing Chan and the Chan Clan, again animated by an Australian producer called Eric Porter Studios, that replaced Shaggy and Scooby with Detective Charlie Chan and Dog Choo Choo, but which still had them drive around in a van to solve mysteries. In another representation win for the studio this decade, the title character of Charlie Chan was actually voiced by an actor of Chinese descent named Key Luke, which was the only time that the character hadn't been portrayed by a white actor. The way they handled the series was an approach that the studio leveraged a few times with the Scooby setup, taking an existing property and adapting it. They did the same with the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, making a series with the characters as teens in a band traveling around with their dogs and a supercomputer who assigns them various mysteries to solve. Goober and the Ghost Chasers was another Scooby-ish type show, which followed three teens and a green dog that sometimes turns invisible as they solve ghost-centric mysteries, often involving members of the Partridge family, as it was closely tied into that show. Inch High Private Eye was another one, about a one-inch tall detective who partners with his teenage niece and her friends, and dog, obviously, to solve crimes. Speed Buggy, which is about a group of teens and their sentient dune buggy solving mysteries. Jabberjaw, which is about a teen rock group and their anthropomorphic shark drummer solving underwater mysteries. Clue Club, about some teenage detectives and a pair of talking dogs solving mysteries. And I could go on. I won't though, but I most definitely could. This was absolutely one of the wells that the studio drank most deeply from this decade. Another area the studio focused a lot of production time and effort on over these first years of the 70s was bringing back their classic characters, starting in 1973 with the show Yogi's Gang. This series brought back pretty much every one of the studio's anthropomorphic characters from years past under a single banner to reintroduce them to a new generation. They did the same in 1975 with the new Tom and Jerry Grape Ape Mumbly show, which added Grape Ape as a new classic for them, much like 1974's Hong Kong Fu had done with that character. 
This all culminated toward the end of the decade with the release of Scooby's All-Star Lab Olympics, which over the course of 24 episodes featured almost every Hanna-Barbera original character to exist up to that point. This one was followed up by Yogi's Space Race, which again took the concept and moved it to outer space, this time without the Scooby Gang. Those characters were busy with several new versions and spin-offs of Scooby throughout the decade, including 1975's Scooby-Doo Dynamite Hour, the previously mentioned Scooby-centric Laugh Olympics, and Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo from 1979. The studio also brought back the Flintstones, not only with the aforementioned Pebbles and Bam Bam spin-off, but with Fred Flintstone and Friends in 1977 and the new Fred and Barney show in 1979, which morphed into both Fred and Barney Meet the Thing and Fred and Barney Meet the Schmoo in 79 and 80 respectively. Some other attempts at making new classics didn't quite fare as well this decade though, with shows like The Skatebirds and The CB Bears kind of fizzling out. One of the other areas that the studio looked to for content throughout the decade was in the adaptation of existing properties into animated versions. We've already mentioned this a few times with the Harlem Globetrotters, which would return twice more in the decade with Go Go Globetrotters in 78 and the Super Globetrotters in 79 and the Amazing Chan and the Chan Clan, but there were several more this decade as well. The studio made adaptations of the live action TV shows I Dream of Genie with Genie in 1973, The Addams Family, a science fiction version of the Partridge Family in 74's Partridge Family 2200 AD, 1978's Godzilla and the All-New Popeye Hour, and 79's Casper and the Angels, The New Schmoo, and Amigo and Friends. Additionally, a nine-volume series of specials called Famous Classic Tales was produced between 1973 and 1981, each adapting a famous novel or folk legend into an hour-long animated film. And as I mentioned a little earlier, this series was produced by the studio's new Australian division. Hanna-Barbera also got back into the superhero business in 1973 for the first time since their 1967 Fantastic Four series, this time crossing the comic aisle to DC with an animated version of their Justice League of America. The first incarnation of the Super Friends took the core cast of Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman and Robin, and Aquaman and applied a dash of Scooby-Doo in the form of non-powered teen sidekicks Wendy and Marvin and their animal companion Wonder Dog. The first series only ran for a single 16-episode season, but would prove to be a pillar of the studio's animation for the next decade and a half, releasing a follow-up series called The All-New Super Friends Hour in 1977, and continuing to have a version on the air consistently until 1986. This put the studio in a somewhat unique situation, as in 1979, they were also producing shorts of Fantastic Four member The Thing in partnership with Marvel Comics, meaning they were working for both companies concurrently. The studio worked on more than just animated TV series this decade, though, also producing several theatrical and television films and specials, and continuing with advertising, industrial films, and educational products. Their industrial film output remained fairly consistent through this period, but was shut down by the end of the decade with their last entry produced in 1979, as did their advertising work, which continued till 1990. In their education focus series, the company released three productions between 1974 and 76 for John Deere, Xerox, and Georgetown University. But perhaps most popularly, they released an entire set of educational film strips between 1977 and 80 that featured a broad lineup of their classic characters and covered several topics from nutrition to safe driving over its 26 entries. They also produced animation for several external projects, including a couple of episodes of Love, American Style for Paramount Pictures one of which served as a pilot for a new prime time series called Wait Till Your Father Gets Home, which is the one I lied about earlier and said I'd get to. Having said that, yeah, we'll come back to it. They also created a series of shorts using the character Peter Puck to air during NBC's NHL coverage, which explained hockey rules and history during games. They also also provided an animated sequence for the MGM historical anthology film That's Entertainment Part 2, which was a retrospective of that studio's films from the 1930s through the 50s. Speaking of films, HB also contributed the opening sequence in the 1980 Robin Williams starring Popeye film, and an opening sequence for 1979 TV game show, Whew. Production of these sorts of sequences were another line of business the studio got out of this decade, with Popeye being the last one they created. There were three feature films from the company that ended up in theaters during the 70s, with one being animated and the other two live action. On the animated side was an adaptation of E.B. White's story, Charlotte's Web, in 1973, which was their third feature film and the first not based on one of their existing characters. The live-action films the studio released this decade were Baxter in 1973, about the challenges faced by a boy with a speech impediment, and CHOMPS, which is an acronym for Canine Home Protection System, released in 1979. That one was a family-oriented comedic sci-fi movie about a robot guard dog. 
More noteworthy than any of those were the studio's TV movies from that decade, which consisted first of a combination of six live-action or animated contributions to the after-school specials, covering topics like running away, winning the lottery, and the importance of classical music, amongst others. Hanna-Barbera also released a series of seven entries into the ABC Saturday Superstar movie lineup between 1972 and 73. These included an animated pilot for Yogi's Gang called Yogi's Arklark, adaptations of the classic stories Oliver Twist and Robin Hood, called Oliver and the Artful Dodger and the Adventures of Robin Hoodnick, and adaptations of the live shows Gidget, The Banana Splits, Bewitched, and Lost in Space. Finally, the studio produced 16 animated television or holiday specials to round out their work for this decade. Just to make sure we give credit where it's due, the studio had several original productions they released over the decade as well. The first of these was the briefly mentioned primetime series Wait Till Your Father Gets Home. It's kind of like an animated Archie Bunker, telling stories about a family where the conservative father butts heads with the liberal kids and the fanatically right-wing neighbor. The series is notable for starring the only man to ever intimidate the Fonz with Tom Bosley as the father of the title, and for being one of the first roles for actor Jackie Earl Haley as son Jamie. There was a version of the Flintstones set in the Roman Empire called the Roman Holidays, which didn't really catch on and only lasted 13 episodes. Valley of the Dinosaurs followed a modern 70s family accidentally transported to prehistory and forced to survive, released the same year as another live-action prehistoric series called Korg 70,000 BC. There was a Slice of Life series from 1974 in the form of These Are the Days, a stunt show inspired by Evil Knievel called Devlin, and the underwater-based Sea Lab 2020, which followed a group of researchers at the bottom of the ocean. Lastly, it was a very limited attempt at another primetime series that ran for five episodes in 1978 called the Hanna-Barbera Happy Hour. It was a variety show hosted by a pair of puppets that were supported by weekly celebrity guest stars and actors in costumes of Hanna-Barbera classic characters. All in all, it was a pretty busy decade for the studio, but not everything they tried was successful. Duffy's Dozen is a show I mentioned earlier that the studio pitched in 1971, but it wasn't the only series that they couldn't get traction for this decade. Taggart's Treasures was an Australian-produced live-action pilot aired on ABC on December 31, 1976, which never got picked up as a series. They tried again in 1977 with the live-action comedy series The Beach Girls, no idea when or where this one aired, and once more in 1978 with a mixed-media, live-action, and animated variety show called The Funny World of Fred and Bunny, which got its single airing on CBS on August 30th of that year. In 1979, the studio made one final push with a pair of live-action pilots. The first was Sergeant TKU, a crime drama starring Korean-American actor Johnny Yoon and aired on NBC on January 24th, and the second being a circus competition hosted by Ed McMahon and Georgia Engel following American circus acts competing against others from around the world at the 1979 Circus World Championship, which also aired a couple weeks later on NBC on February 13th. But these failed pilots begged the question of why the studio even kept trying. Well, although it never really seemed to be a point of contention between the two, because by all accounts nothing ever really was, this was primarily due to Joseph Barbera, who was interested in live action, with William Hanna and most of the studio's other members just content to stay in the world of animation. However, Barbera had some ideas that he felt were right for live action and pursued that path on both television and film, the latter through partnerships with his friend Samuel Arkoff, Vice President of American International Pictures. Chomps was the first movie produced under a four-film deal with that company, but that deal was canceled after it flopped, making $1.8 million on a $3.5 million budget. It also seems to have been the last attempt by the studio to succeed in the live-action market, as their output over the following two decades was almost exclusively animated. In general, the 70s was a fairly stable decade for Hanna-Barbera. The company experienced no changes in ownership, distributor, or parent company, remaining with Taft Broadcasting until 1987. They remained in the same building throughout the entire period. They had a steady output and viewership throughout. The only real items in their history to note during the 70s were the criticism they received from other animation artists, the departure of Joe Ruby and Ken Spears in 1977, and their working relationship with Mark Lavoy that started in 1979. The criticism during this time was mostly revolved around the studio's tendency to recycle work between projects and the fact that their use of limited frames notably made the characters more static than in most theatrical animation. This criticism mostly came from other professionals in the industry, though, and had little to no impact on the huge number of the studio's viewers and fans. The second point I mentioned here did have more of an impact, as the departure of Ruby and Spears to found their own studio in 1977 meant the loss of some of their most prolific in-house talent and the rise of some real competition going into the 80s. 
We'll see examples of that, though, throughout the next decade with the new series from the studio, as the majority are reuses of existing characters or adaptations of other properties. The last item I noted was the work the studio began with computer scientist Mark Lavoy on the development of a digital inking and painting system, which led to the studio reducing production costs even further than they'd been able to with limited animation alone. Lavoy even accepted the role of director of the Hanna-Barbera Animation Laboratory from 1980 to 83, and the processes and technology he helped the company develop remained in use until 1996. As I did in the last video, here's a rapid fire look at the studio's full lineup of series for the decade, as I touched on quite a few, but uh, I might have missed some of them.
And now, sorry to do this to you all, but that's where I'm cutting this one off. The script's already getting pretty long and pretty dense, so I'm going to save the rest for what hopefully works out to be just one more video. Considering that in the 70s, according to my list and count, Hanna-Barbera produced 101 out of the total 139 animated series that were aired, or 72.5% if you prefer. Not to mention all the other areas they worked in, like movies and TV specials, it's not terribly surprising that this decade got so heavy here. Looking ahead, I think I can probably finish the studio out with one more video before we move on to someone new, but I'd foolishly hope I could do that here. Alas, it is what it is. I'll have a new poll up for the next alternating video tomorrow, and don't forget to check back this weekend for 1996 in the animated 90s. Also, I've already picked the topic for next week's deep dive, so you can all look forward to seeing Dino Riders in that one. And finally, last call for ideas about a 2,000 subscriber video, as I'll probably have to move from planning to making that soon. Anyway, like the video if you did, and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, everyone. Stay tuned, and stay tuned, as in cartoons. Later.